Welcome to the Jed Burke Podcast. I'm the creator and host, Fran Rachopi. Each episode, I speak with transformative leaders, visionaries, drivers of change, and those dedicated to winning no matter the challenge. The Jedberg Podcast is founded in the lineage of the special operations Jedberg teams of the past and is produced in partnership with Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm focused on helping you optimize the people side of your business. We're sponsored by Jersey Mike Subs. Together, we share the mission of giving, making a difference in someone's life. Visit the Jedberg Podcast, Talent War Group, and Jersey Mike Subs on the web and on all social media. A percentage of all proceeds is dedicated to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Boston was at the forefront of America, and Boston firefighters are at the forefront of firefighting. We're a very historic department. Based on our traditions, we take a lot of pride in them, and we rely on them to set the example and set the bar for how professional fire departments should conduct business. I don't pray for war. I pray for peace. But if war comes, I want a peace. It's the same thing in the fire service. Like, I don't pray for fires, but if there's a fire, I want them to call me because I got a great crew, and I think we're going to go, we'll do whatever it takes to get to help people out, firemen or civilians. Some people serve others no matter what. In 1631, Boston became the first city in the New World to install fire ordinance. In 1678, Boston became the first fire department in the nation. In 1678, we didn't even have a nation. For over 344 years, the Boston Fire Department has led America and set the example for excellence, standards, and service to others. Today, Boston's firefighters are supported and empowered by the Boston Firefighters Union, Local 718. For this September 11th special edition episode, I went home to Boston to sit down with a group of Bostonians who know no other mission than to preserve and protect life. I'm not going to lie. This is a Boston Strong episode as I sit down with a few of my good friends, fellow veterans, Boston natives, and now Boston firefighters. First, I sat down with newly elected president of Local 718, Sam Dillon. Sam served as a Marine, spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan, and was awarded the Purple Heart after being shot in the chest. Sam rose through the ranks as the department battled COVID immunization requirements and lockdowns while still being called on a daily basis to serve the city and its citizens. Sam and I discussed the effects of the mayor's COVID requirements on the department. Why his three pillars of solidarity, advocacy, and respect are essential to the next generation of Boston firefighter, and the mental health challenges first responders face every single day on the job. In the post-9-11 world, the Boston Fire Department maintains one of the strongest veteran communities in the country. To continue our conversation about service and camaraderie, I asked a few more to join Sam and I for a roundtable discussion on getting the job done in the global war on terror and back home on the streets of Boston. Greg Kelly comes from a long line of Boston firefighters and recently retired from the Army after a distinguished career as a Green Beret in the Special Forces. Tony McDonough served in the infantry. He was one of my first friends in the Army. Now he runs a construction company in Boston and has been in the department since he left service. Finally, Josh Stewart Shore continues his service after his time leading Special Operators as a Green Beret and being wounded in combat. There's not much this group hasn't seen and there's almost nothing they're unwilling to do when the bell rings and the sirens blast something that happened at least six times in the few hours I was with them. These are men who used to run towards the sound of gunfire. Now, they run towards burning buildings. We're taught as kids to respect and honor those who run towards chaos and danger to protect others. As adults, we often forget that humanity and kindness still exist in this world. When I left Eggleston Square and the Patriots of Tower Ladder 10 and Engine 42, I remembered that most heroes don't save lives in far-off lands. Most heroes save lives on the streets of America day in and day out. Take a listen on your favorite podcast platforms. Watch the full video version of my conversation with Sam, Greg, Tony, and Josh on YouTube. Subscribe to us and follow at Jedberg Podcast on all social media. Check out our website, jedbergpodcast.com. Learn more about Local 718 and the Boston Fire Department at bostonfirelocal718.org. And follow them on social media at Boston Firefighters. Sam, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolute honor to be here in at the Eggleston Square Firehouse, newest firehouse in all the Boston Fire Fire Department. Correct. So uh, we're breaking it in, right? Yeah, this is good. <laughs> there's, like, there's like still, I, I see there's still boxes around. I mean, guys still don't want to touch anything. Yeah, they'll, they'll be moving in here for the next 10 years. There'll still be boxes. <laughs> it's, like, it's like my house. Yeah. But well, the, the Technical Rescue Task Force operates out of here. They're doing about 4,000 incidents a year. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of volume. District 9, Division 2, mm-hmm. um, the guys were out when we first got here. I think there's some trickling back, but we, we have to put it out that two things. Number one, we are in an active firehouse. Very so, active. So uh, 
So we're going to have the full recording and whatever happens yep. here happens here, right? Which is great. And Hopefully we can give you a few surprises along the way, <laughs> yeah. kind of liven it up. Uh, well, we, and we have the peanut gallery in the back who we're going to bring in later. Okay. And that's, and I'm looking forward to bringing them in and talk about their, their stories and uh, what brought them from the military into, uh, into the fire department and everybody here is from Boston. So the most important thing that I have to put out to everybody before we start this conversation is if you're from New York, you better shut it off. Yeah. because there's not going to be a whole lot here for <laughs> there's you. There's nothing that they're going to get out of this conversation. This is this is a hometown crowd and and everybody in this in here uh comes from this city mm -hmm. and I've been joking with uh Jenny and Steph all day as we've been you know, this is our second recording of the day and we've been around the city this afternoon and I said this that uh you know this is home and mm -hmm. this is the greatest city in the world and they keep asking me why and I keep trying to give them reasons and it's like you can't explain it you just got to be here. And what a best place you could experience it. I mean, this is the best city in the world and you're going to be surrounded by people who believe that not only is this the best city in the world, but it's worth protecting and defending at damn near all costs. And it's, and it's where it started. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, the true, truly most important thing, you know, I believe about this city is that this, this is, this is where America started. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and we've defended that freedom mm -hmm. out of this city for a very long time. And that's what I love about it. You're the president of Boston Firefighters Local 718, the Firefighters Union. You're also a brother in arms, Marine Corps veteran. So I won't hold that against you. Semper Fi. <laughs> so, so we'll, so I know, I know you were talking about your tomahawk yesterday and Tony was laughing about my ice axe, right? <laughs> but you are the recipient of, of Purple Heart for a wound sustained in combat. You've also been awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal with Valor and I appreciate so much your time today. No, thank I you know very you much. have a lot going on. You're new in the job, yep. and, uh, and we're going to talk about it all. Let's get into it. Let's start with the union. Mm -hmm. Lo Local 718 sworn in office June 16th, 2022, so just a couple months ago. You've been in the department since 2013. You served prior as an honor guard, a house steward, and on the exec as an executive board representative. What is Local 718? What do they do for the department? So firefighters of this city's lifeline. And this union, it, it's the lifeline for firefighters and their families. Um, we advocate for the people who do this job, a very dangerous job. And you need strong advocacy for people who do dangerous jobs like this. And not just for them, like I said, for their families. I mean, every time that a Boston firefighter goes to work, there's the very real chance that they might not come home. And along the way, their health is going to suffer, mental, physical, um, you know, we talked about how active this firehouse is. Every time they go out the door, they don't know what they're gonna encounter. You have to have an organization dedicated to advocating for people who do a job like that. Benefits, salaries, contracts, working conditions, health. Uh, that's what Local 718 is. It, it is it's, the, it's the family that represents our family as firefighters. And we're talking about 2,000 people. Right. Yeah, we have uh, about 1,600 active members and over 1,000 retirees. Why, why run for president? Um, it was, wasn't on my radar. It, I, when I came on this job, I was, first of all, just happy to be a Boston firefighter, my lifelong ambition. Um, as my career kind of progressed, I saw the importance of the union, so I started getting involved. Um, I never really imagined myself running for a union president. I always saw myself as someone who would volunteer to help out, kind of a behind the scenes guy or a mission specific guy. Um, basically what changed my mind was several months ago, uh, we were coming up on a union election and it was the people that approached me, um, firefighters that I worked with and their families. And when I talk about family, this job, this profession, we are a family. And sometimes, I mean, we're, we're spending more time, I spend more time with my brother and sister firefighters, unfortunately, than I do my own family. Yeah. And when your family comes to you with something, that means something. And to have the people who know me best, the people who can anticipate my actions in a fire, in a firehouse, and in my life, when they know what I'm about, and when you have them come to you and say, we want you to be a leader in our organization, we want you to be our advocate, uh, that's something you have to give a lot of thought and consideration to. Uh, that's what happened. I gave it thought and consideration. I, I talked to my family outside of the firehouse and um, it made sense. I, when you are someone, and this goes back to the military, yeah. to the firehouse, 
when, when you're someone who believes in taking action, when you're someone who believes in standing up for the things you believe in and the people that you believe in, you don't always get to pick your time. Sometimes your time picks you. And I just happen to be the right person in the right situation to take a shot at this and see what I could get done. Let's talk for a second about the institution of the Boston Fire Department, because I think, I think it's important. You know, we were talking before we started about being the first, and we mm -hmm. threw some of those out here when we started, but I, I did some history okay. all right, this morning, right? Well, <laughs> and, and so We I, are I, a very historic I, department. I, I, I had my lesson this morning, but so 1631, mm -hmm. first fire ordinance mm -hmm. in Boston, 1653, first fire engine, I, although I, I call it an engine, but I don't think we had engines back then, 1670. We'll call it an engine. We'll call it an engine, all right. I don't Six, know what they call it. <laughs> a wagon, yep. I think it was more like a wagon. Some type of buggy. 1678, first fire department mm -hmm. established with the first chief, Thomas Atkins. 1799, First leather fire hoses are imported from England, but there's one part that I have to call out that's on the website that's missing. And it's okay. like this whole piece right around 1776 where I think a lot of Boston firefighters mm -hmm. also defeated the, at that point, the best military in the world in Absolutely. the American Revolution. Yeah. So I would, if I had to go back, I would say that probably a lot of firefighters were, in, were on that mission. Starting fires and putting them out. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping ourselves in business. <laughs> And creating America. Yeah. Well, well, what? One one man's insurgent is another man's freedom fighter? One man's insurgent is another man's firefighter. <laughs> that too. And then 1870s, steam engines, trucks, ladders, industrial revolution, alarms, mm -hmm. and then real fire regulation kind of starts coming yep. to play. And then 1914 is the first selection process that gets built for firefighters to come into the department. I want to ask about about that mm -hmm. selection process, but before we do that, I want to throw out some stuff for today yep. because we talked about the scale of this firehouse, but I think it's really important. You know, seventy five thousand annual calls, two hundred million dollar annual budget. We talked about two thousand firefighters, thirty three engine companies, twenty ladder companies, two tower ladders, marine unit, safety division, special operations command, hazardous materials, decontamination unit, technical rescue support, and one collapse unit. Did I get them all? I that sounds good to me. I'd have, I don't have my notes in front of me, but we'll go with that. You're looking at my yeah. notes. Yeah. <laughs> but tremendous, tremendous amount going on. Talk to me first about when I go through this, mm -hmm. what do you feel? Pride. You know, we, uh, like you said, Boston was at the forefront of America, and Boston firefighters are at the forefront of firefighting. We're a very historic department. Based on our traditions, we take a lot of pride in them, and we rely on them to set the example and set the bar for how professional fire departments should conduct business. Uh, we're a very aggressive department. We are not afraid by any means to conduct aggressive interior attacks, aggressive search and rescue, aggressive fire suppression operations. We're a unique city, very dense population, old buildings, old infrastructure. Uh, it's very susceptible to critical incidents and to damage from fire. And we're firefighters by name, we're firefighters by trade, but we're also America's problem solvers. We're Boston's mm -hmm. lifeline, Boston's problem solvers. You mentioned hazardous materials, building collapses, technical rescues, water rescues. If it's happening in the city and it's happening to a resident of this city, we are going to respond and we are gonna mitigate that situation. And I, I, I take a tremendous amount of pride in that, not just as a union president to represent every member who rides apparatus on those various companies um to as a firefighter like just to be a part of that i, I have immense pride yeah. in being the president of this union but i have even more pride in just being a boss and firefighter that's what i am first that's what that that's what's at the core of me and the city's unique too because mm -hmm. you think about the city it's I mean, it's like a small town in some, in some yeah. ways, right? And then, but it represents itself as a city. But when you think about the United States mm -hmm. and you think on a global scale, everybody knows Boston. Right. You know, and, and then you come here and you're like, wait, I can walk from one side of Boston to the other in a couple and of hours. And for a walking city, look at everything that we, that we cram into Boston. Yeah. You know, walk 15 minutes down the road from this firehouse and you have high rises. Mm -hmm. Walk 15 minutes in another direction, you have densely populated wood frame residentials, residences. And th this fire department is responsible for all of that. In order to be a Boston firefighter, in order to be a successful Boston firefighter, you have to be 
a master of your craft and a master of your trade. You have to know how to fight a high rise fire at nine in the morning. You have to know how to fight a three decker fire at three o'clock in the afternoon. And then around midnight or 1 a.m., you have to go to a complex technical rescue, ropes, water, that this firehouse alone encompasses all of that in a single 24 hour tour. That's a lot to take in. We have a lot of pride in that. And lives are depending on that. Absolutely. Our lives, but more importantly, the lives of the citizens of Boston. A goal that you set when you took this job, and I want to I quote it here, mm -hmm. was to get into the firehouses in Union Hall, never miss an opportunity to interact with the membership. It's not about telling the membership what you want. It's about listening to what they want and then providing the leadership and guidance that's going to get them there. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important? Uh, because I don't have all the answers. I'm, whether I have this job for two years, whether I have this job for 10 years, I'm never going to have all the answers. But someone in our membership does. The strength of this union is its membership. The things that I don't know, someone else does. And if, we, if I can't find somebody with the answer, we're going to bring everybody in and we're going to have a conversation about it. We're going to bounce ideas off of each other. And we're not going to, we're probably not going to agree, but that's how you create viable solutions. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a great thing. Oh. Um, I, you know, I, I can't paint on this, but because I believe in it, the strength of this union is its membership. I'm very fortunate. You talk about, you, you need passion and leadership, but you need passion and membership. How lucky am I? My membership, they run into burning buildings for a living. They yeah. put their lives on the line every single day. And they believe in it and they, and, and they enjoy it. It's difficult, but this is what they were called to do. You want to talk about passion? They, they're passionate individuals and they approach this union with the same passion that they run into a burning building with. That's fantastic. You have a membership like that, there's absolutely nothing that we can't accomplish as a union. And they do it, you do it for each other. And you think back, you know, to the law enforcement, the fire department, the time in the military. Mm -hmm. I mean, I tell I work with organizations on building their teams right now mm -hmm. in the corporate sector. And it's a lot of same, a lot of the, a lot of the similar <laughs> principles, yeah. very, very different people. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the things that I, I say to a lot of organizations is that I come from a place where we go out mm -hmm. on an, on a mission and I'm, and I'm going to, willing to sacrifice my life for the guy next to me. And I might not even like that guy. Mm -hmm. like, and I've, we've had guys that we knew were getting kicked off the team the next week, you know, weren't star performers. You generally just didn't like their face for whatever reason, but you were willing to take a bullet for those people any day of the week. Because it's not about you and it's not about them. It's about being integral in something that you all believe is more important than you yourself. Yeah. You know, you, the mission, the yeah. mission stands above mission, everything. Mission team self in that order. Yeah. You know, and you might not like the person that you're on the mission with. You might not like the person that you're on the team with at that time, but you know what? You have to respect them because you, by respecting them, you respect that mission, you respect that team. And you know that that's what you need to do to get to accomplish that mission and to keep that team together. We talk a lot on the podcast about these characteristics of performance that are used by Special Operations Command. Specifically, there's nine of them, and it's what SOF uses to recruit and assess talent. Mm -hmm. Strength, resiliency, adaptability, humility, integrity, curiosity, team ability, effective intelligence, and emotional strength. What are you looking for out of the firefighters that come in and, and, and apply and try out to come into the department? And what's that selection process look like? So what am I personally looking for? Not, not as a union president, as a, yeah, as you, a boss and yeah. firefighter. Put your do, other hat on. Yeah, who do, <laughs> who do I want to see as fellow boss and firefighters? Number one, you have to want this job, and I shouldn't even call it a job. You have Lifestyle. To yeah, you, you have to believe and genuinely believe at some level that you were called to do this. And if you don't, that's okay but just understand eventually that's going to get exposed mm -hmm. as is, as is the case with any high stress, high stakes profession. Um, we are willing to lose our lives for each other. We are willing to lose our lives for the city of Boston for total strangers. Absolutely. For no other reason than 
they are involved in a situation that we're responsible for. And it is their life above ours. That supersedes a paycheck. That supersedes benefits. That supersedes any accolades that may come with this job. You have to, at some level, believe that you were called upon to be a Boston firefighter. Number one, that's, that's who I want to be alongside me. Number two, just be, be passionate, be dedicated. Everyone should have it in their mind. Like, I'm not becoming a Boston firefighter to ride a fire truck. I'm becoming a Boston firefighter because I want to be the best Boston firefighter that I can be. I want to save lives. I want to prevent loss of property. You, know, you, you have to really have a, a drive. That's, that's who I want. That's who I want next to me. That's who I want next to my membership. And what's that selection process look like? Uh, we have an open competitive civil service exam offered to the public. I believe it's every year now. Um, written test, physical abilities test, combined raw scores. Uh, state commission produces a hiring list. That gets kicked over to the city and the department. We bring candidates in for interviews. Uh, they whittle that down off the eligibility list. Uh, and then you go to the academy. We have a six, six or seven month training academy. Um, and it's a grind, you know, Monday through Friday. Uh, and they, they, they try to cover all the bases. You get a fundamental amount of knowledge and training in fire suppression, search and rescue, different things that we do. Um, but just like basic in the military, it, that's, that's entry level. Yeah, the job starts when yeah. you're done. If, if you, Train, everything starts if you when you're stop done. learning when you leave the academy, you're not going to be here very long. Yeah. It's just not going to work because you're, you're not going to be able to cut it. You're not going to be good at your job. Yeah. Have you, guys, have you heard of Fit Fighter? Fit Fighter? Yeah. No. We have to introduce. We have to introduce. Yeah, the hose. Yeah, Tony's over here making the oh, hose okay. thing. Yeah. So we had we had Sarah. Oh, these guys are going out. Yep. Yeah. So we had we had the we had it, we could hear it in the background. Yeah. Um, we had Sarah Apgar mm -hmm. on, uh, and Sarah Apgar is um she was in the she was in, she was in the army, mm -hmm. uh, and she got out started this cut she then she became a volunteer firefighter in long island and she you know she's big into fitness and realized that like the training they were doing wasn't matching mm -hmm. the hose you know what what you actually do once you're out in the field so she took these pieces of hose and then started filling them with like different components of sand and different oh, wow. different things and then created different sizes of them so that you can work out with these different lengths of hose and she developed these entire workout programs for it. It's called Fit Fighter. And then she went on Shark Tank. Oh, and really? she okay. won Shark Tank. And Daniel Lubetsky, who's the founder mm -hmm. of Kind, you know, Kind Bars, picked her up. And now she's working with fire departments all over the country. And she had and like she, you know, they they bring these different components of hoses and they got all these workouts. It's actually pretty That's cool. That's pretty cool. So I'll say I'll say it. To you. Yeah, I mean in func <laughs> functional fitness, yeah. functional training is essential to what we do. You know, it, at, this training is being modernized. Human performance is being mm -hmm. modernized. Why not apply that to the fire service? Why not apply that to what we do to make ourselves sharpen the knife a little bit, make mm -hmm. ourselves even more capable to do our jobs? Yeah, yeah, she was great. I did like a workout with her after we recorded the episode. <laughs> it's, it's on YouTube. I was just smoked I in like two that. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Your election to president of mm -hmm. the union represents a bit of a, a changing of the guard. Yep. And this new generation, I asked about the, the recruiting and, and you know the selection process to come in, but a lot of veterans mm -hmm. out of the military have come in over the last 20 years in the fire department. We're very proud of that. And I, what's the number? I don't, I don't have, I, I couldn't find a total. I don't know if you have a percentage. Or, uh, percentage of veterans, it, it's, it's high. It's, it's high. very high. Yeah. And, uh, and, with your election, this mm -hmm. you know the older generation you know, has has now passed that on to you. Why is that important for the department? And you know, first off, and then second, what do you learn from from those guys? And then what are the opportunities that you take forward? And what are you mm -hmm. looking for? I mean, first off, what do I learn from the, those who came before yeah. me? Everything. I mean, they they wrote the book. They were very successful, very passionate, uh, especially coming out of local seven eighteen and the, the Massachusetts area, as far as labor leaders go and labor leaders within the public safety unions, I got some incredibly big shoes to fill. Um, it, it's, it's not a changing of the guard. 
it's just uh, maybe I don't even want to passing use, of the torch, passing of the, passing tor- of the yeah, torch. Thank you, because it's it's not new versus old. Yeah. It's not young versus old. It's just it's a natural progression of things. But I I have a responsibility to know the history of this union, to know the leaders that came before me, and look at what they did and build on their successes. If if that older guard hadn't been as dedicated and passionate as they were, I'm not sitting here. Yeah. There is, I, I wouldn't have a job as a Boston firefighter, and there would be no union for me to ever run for president of. I have the utmost respect in the world for everybody who came before me. They're the first calls that I make on a lot of issues, but I also have a responsibility to the entire membership, so then I make other calls. I, I call people younger than me, I call my peers, and we basically are trying to build a, a, a dyna- dynamic leadership, you know, much like the fire service. There's a lot of things that we do that we've done since the 1600s. We don't do them just because that's how it is. No, we do it because it works. Yeah. So you, ha- you can't be afraid to stand on what works, but you also can't be afraid to try new things. Let's talk about the Marine Corps. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I have to, you've been waiting for that one. <laughs> it's getting antsy in my seat. <laughs> you, you graduated high school. You went right into the Marine Corps. 2005. Why? 9-11. September 11th. We're going to talk about it. This is, so I told you this is going to be our 9-11 episode. Mm-hmm. And that's Very why proud I, of that. that, that I, I, and when I was thinking, when Tony talked to me about coming in and talk to you, I, I, I called him back about 10 minutes after we got off the phone because I was instantly said, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I was, he's like, all right, let me know the dates. And I was you know, going through my head. I was driving in the car and I was going home from here. And, uh, and I was like, this is the 9-11 episode. That's awesome. Absolutely. And, I, and you know, Greg, Greg's yeah. over there and him and I have been talking now for a while on and off. And, and, and so is Josh. And you know, we've been speaking. Greg, Greg's ears perked up when you said Marine Corps. <laughs> he, he woke up over there. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding me? He, the, the Sergeant Major's over there going, you're always being assessed. That's what he's mm-hmm. saying to himself over there. But, but absolutely, I, I was like, this has to be the 9 11 episode. Mm-hmm. Because cause everybody here, when we bring these guys in, we'll talk about it. But I mean, that, that impacted this city. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, we, you know, cer- certainly. In New York was ground zero of mm-hmm. this thing, but you know the planes emanated from here. You know the city was impacted. We were all here, mm-hmm. you know, in some fashion. Um, so nine nine eleven puts you in, and what was the, the call? The call to service. So I, my lifelong goal was to be a Boston firefighter. I was going to end up. I was going to become a Boston firefighter no matter what. Um, I I always thought about joining the military. I had friends, I had family members who were veterans. I always had the utmost respect for them. Um, but it does come back to 9-11. Nine, the, the attack on this country, that day I decided that I was joining the Marine Corps, I wanted to be infantry, and I wanted to go and fight. Um, there were enemies of this nation that delivered violence upon this country, on, on our fellow Americans and our way of life. And I wanted, we talked about, when you are someone who can do something about a situation and you find yourself in that situation, it is incumbent on you as, as, as a human and as an American to take action. And you cannot sit idly by when your country and your way of life is attacked. It needs to be answered for, and it needs to be confronted. Spent tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And you got shot in the chest. I did. I did. <laughs> what, what happened? Uh, I, I zigged, we're laughing I, about it now. Yeah, no, that's funny, right. I was, I was laughing. You're here, I so was we, so we can laugh now. about it. I, I zigged when I should have zagged. They, they, got me, they caught me sleeping on that one. No, it was, um, I was in Maj, Afghanistan. I was the uh, section leader for a uh, partner mentor team. So we were, we were involved with training uh, local nationals to be Afghan police officers and Afghan soldiers. Uh, the forward operating base that we were out of uh, had been under attack. Um, we punched out some Marine patrols and uh, they got caught up in it. They got pinned down. Um, we went out with our team of Afghans to provide uh, some react and uh, we ended up getting caught up in it too. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it's funny. People, sometimes people are like, oh, you, you know, they know I, I, I got hurt and they're like, oh, you, you, you're so unlucky. You know, you get the worst luck in the world. I have the best luck in the world because I'm still sitting here. Yeah, and a lot of people aren't. And the, the person responsible, he, he's not doing a podcast today. He's yeah. not doing much of anything. Um, I, I take pride in what happened to me. And it's, it's, I think about it every single day. 
because, you know, you get into leadership and, and advocacy for the people around you. I mean, the guys in this room have gotten me out of fires that I otherwise wouldn't have gotten out of. Um, and that was all born from, you know, somebody tried to take my life. And had it not been for the Marines around me, yeah, they probably would have succeeded. So I, I owe my life to other people directly. Um, I spent a couple of years trying to put that out of my head. And then it's like, no, you know what? That's never changing. Embrace yeah. that and be someone that other people can put their lives in your hands. That's how you give back. That's how you make right what anything that happened over there. And that that's I, that's so important. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, we we talk about mental health and we're going to get into it, but I mean, we talk about embracing these experiences that we've had, you know, sometimes becomes easier to do that, to move on than trying to put it back. Mm -hmm. You took your purple heart down to ground zero. I did. When you got back Mm -hmm. and, uh, I watched, I watched the video. That's still out there. That's still out there. The video is still out there on on YouTube. A, a bit younger face. Well, yeah, <laughs> and and no mustache. No mustache. Not not within regs. Yeah. My drill instructor would not approve of this mustache. It's a pretty sick mustache. Thing, I, I gotta tell so. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why why'd you do that? Um, I joined the Marines because of nine eleven. Um, you know, nine eleven was a defining moment of my life. And um, I didn't, it's not that I felt uncomfortable having a purple hat. Um, it, that, that's not a medal on my chest. That's, I carry that somewhere else. And um, I felt that's where it needed to be. You know, and it, 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 it's difficult to explain, but I almost, it, bringing it down there brought a lot of things full circle. And it was like, you know, what people did at ground zero, what other people did to this country, they punched a hole right in the middle of it. And uh, for me personally, me bringing that down there, uh, filled in that hole a little bit. Yeah. It was like, hey, they, my friends and I, my, my countrymen and I, we fought back and we, we went over there and we took you to task for what you did. And, uh, and, and we're still here and we're back. And the, the, there's an even bigger tower Um, it, you know, nice try. I want to ask about transition Mm -hmm. and uh, coming out of the Marine Corps. How's that been? Or how was it? Uh, the most difficult thing I've ever done, you know, deployments. um, It's not, it it doesn't, I don't think it ends. It doesn't. I really really don't think it ends. From the minute you come home, you're always going to be transitioning back towards civilian life. The issue is civilian life as we know it as veterans um, is never going to be what it was before we entered the service. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I went through the progression. I went through the phases. Uh, I was angry. Um, I was, you know, lonely. And, you know, you try to chase, like, I just want things to be the way that they were. But that, that doesn't apply just to veterans. Th- things aren't the way they are right now. That, things are different than they were five minutes ago. Life has changed. Um, Things are never going to go back to the way they were. Um, and that's okay. But you have to accept it. You have to confront the fact that you were changed. You are permanently changed by things that you did and things that were done to you. And if you spend the rest of your life trying to erase them, those things are eventually just going to erase you. Embrace it. Take it on. If you made mistakes, embrace them. If you had things done to you, embrace it because you're still here. And you have a responsibility to the others who aren't to be the best version, be the best veteran that you can be, be the best firefighter that you can be, be the best person that you can be. You talk about change. Mm-hmm. The last two and a half years has created monumental change in the world mm-hmm. here in Boston. A lot of it due to the COVID pandemic. Mm-hmm. The New England, greater New England area, let's put it that way, you know, not only Massachusetts and Boston, but the greater New England area was, you know, as everyone was, was was pretty well affected. But we also was very, very strict in a lot of the protocols that were put in place by you know, local state governments, as opposed to like, you know, Florida and Texas. And like, mm-hmm. you know, I went to Florida for a couple of months during COVID and they're like, what's COVID? <laughs> like, well, if you, got, you know, go up north, they'll don't, tell you what don't, it is. Don't tell my boss, but I did too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
But COVID, I mean, it shut the city down mm-hmm. in so many ways. But when you look at the fire department, when you look at medical response, when mm-hmm. you look at law enforcement, those calls rose. Absolutely. And I, I not to correct you, but it, it shut the city down. It shut Boston down. Yeah. It didn't shut down the Boston Fire Department. What did, what, how did that impact the department? Um, it was a lot. It, our, call vo- our, our call volume increased, and it, it was the unknown. And I go back to firefighters by name, problem solvers by trade. It was like, okay, this is, this is something new. This is something scary to us, to the general public. Uh, in our lifetime. Yeah, you're not immune to it. No, and we we didn't know what was going on, but we did know that we had to respond because the day that COVID hit, people started calling 911 about it. And, okay, well, yeah, we can figure this out as we go and we can educate ourselves as we go, but right now there's a resident of this city, someone's calling 911, we're on the other end of the line. Yeah, get up and go. Get up and respond and do what you have to do because that's what we do. And um, it, it, was, it was very taxing on the fire department. It was very taxing on our union membership. And it was taxing to a borderline already overtaxed system. You know, we, we don't have the manpower that we need. We always need additional resources. And the, you're throwing something as massive as a pandemic into that. Um, but you know what? Through it all, our people rose to the occasion. And they, they did what Boston firefighters and they did what local 718 members do. They had a challenge delivered to them, they assessed it, and they went right back and said, all right, what do we have to do? Okay, let's go get the job done. And you also got thrown a challenge by, by the mayor. You, know, and you were put in mm-hmm. a situation where you had a vaccine mandate put in place. If you didn't comply, guys were going to lose their job. And mm-hmm. if, you know, firefighters, good, good people out there doing the right thing, as you said, are going to lose their job for not meeting that mandate. I know that that's still, you're st- still working through some of the ramifications of that. Mm-hmm. Nobody lost their job. Nobody lost their job. They're still here, which still is a here, good thing. Which is where we need them to be, which is where this city needs them to be. How, how has it changed the department? Um, I mean, we're, we're still dealing with the effects of COVID, uh, the aftermath of that, some of the mandate issues. And I mean, COVID, COVID is still out there. We still, have, we still respond to 911 calls where people have COVID. It's... it's it's definitely going in the right direction. We're confident that it's going to continue to go in the right direction, but it's, it's still out there. Um, you know, the, the, the mandate issue um, was very detrimental to the morale yeah. of our membership. And it's unfortunate because, yeah, the global pandemic of COVID was unprecedented, but a situation like this, this is an unprecedented where we were needed. Boston firefighters were needed because between us, the police, and Boston EMS, in terms of being out on the street, we were the front line. And this city needed us, and we were there. And then after, after the fact, when, it, when you could see the light at the end of the tunnel, where you could see that, all right, we're getting through this. We're going to get through this. Um, maybe we weren't considered as essential anymore. Maybe we weren't afforded that respect. Um, there's still lingering effects of that. And for, we talked about we're a younger job. Um, for a lot of guys on the job, this, gener- this younger generation, this was their first experience of what it feels like to make it through the end, to, to be called upon, to respond, to do what you need to do. And Ab- then, I'd say above and beyond uh, what you need to do. I mean, for, as far as above and beyond goes, that's just where we operate because there is no limit to what we'll do for people. There's no limit to what we will do for this city. And we're, I know we're going to touch on it a little bit when it comes to the respect part. That demands, I demand that that be respected. That's my job as the president of this union is to remind people there is nothing that we won't do for this city. And all we ask for in return is proper, proper and fair treatment and the respect. Not that we say that we deserve the respect that we go out and earn every single day. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about it. You, I mean, because you went there. So. You have three pillars mm-hmm. that you're that you're focused on as you've assumed this role: solidarity, advocacy, and respect. And you brought up respect. This is I, I, this is a big deal right now. I, and we were talking about it last night when we were on the phone. But I mean, this is 
the respect that is given by society today to law enforcement, police, firefighters, you know, general law mm-hmm. <laughs> regulation, you know, I th- I would say is probably at the lowest it, it's ever been, at least in, well, you know, certainly I, in my lifetime. Lowest I've ever seen it. And yet you have to go out there every single day mm-hmm. and continue to execute in this job the way that you said it. How do you motivate the department? How do I? I motivate our membership by reminding them who they are and reminding them to always remind themselves, hey, no matter what anyone says, no matter what anyone does, look yourself in the mirror and just remind yourself that you're right. You're, you're a firefighter. You're going out there and you are doing whatever it takes to help people you're we're, you're right you are in the right people who we're 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 open to criticism you know sometimes it's warranted but at the end of the day we're putting our lives on the line for our city we're putting our lives on the line for the people who live here There's, you are in the right by doing that people have issues with that that's on them but when i talk about earning respect we don't get into it with people we we go and help the people who are criticizing us yeah. because that's what we do. Yeah. I want to ask about solidarity, mm-hmm. the, 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 f- the first one of that list. You noted that solidarity was critical to the future success of the department, mm-hmm. solidarity with each other, other first responders, law enforcement, the city, the city elected officials themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We interviewed in episode 44, Patrick Murphy, congressman, was the, under, was the secretary, undersecretary of the Army uh, mm-hmm. for a period of time. Uh, he said to me, and because uh, I asked him how you bridge the political divide, uh, and he said, you can disagree, but you cannot be disagreeable. That's great. That's a, that's a fantastic approach. And it, it's true. Um, as, a, as a labor organization, the, our relationship with management, our relationship with the city is going to, it's guaranteed that there are going to be periods of disagreement. There's going to be periods of friction. But most importantly, you can't be, that relationship can't be defined by that. My, my approach to the political aspect is, listen, um, at the end of the day, we talk about a foundation. Look, we're both here for similar reasons. We both serve the citizens of this city. We may go about it in different ways, but we're bound by that service. So we're going to disagree with each other on specific issues. But whatever that disagreement may be, as soon as it's resolved, we go back to center and we go back to the foundation of, okay, you were elected to serve the citizens of the city. I'm a firefighter. I was called to serve the citizens of this city. Let's start there. Let's start from a place of mutual respect and a mutual foundation. It's the, yeah, because it, it can't be personal. It, no, you, it, you can't take it personally. I don't take it personally. I hope they don't take it personally because you can't. Because when you start taking things personally, especially in something like politics, now you're doing a disservice to everybody because yeah. you're allowing your personal, your, your ego, mission team self, now you're putting self at the top of the list. And Local 718 firefighters, we never put ourselves ahead of the city. And we have a hard time understanding why anybody else would either. Yeah. Advocacy was the third piece. You talked a little Mm -hmm. bit about it earlier, but you said that you have to be an advocate. It has to be done professionally. Mm -hmm. It has to be, and it has to be on behalf of them and their families, them being the members themselves. Absolutely. They, you know, other than my immediate family, um, you know, I, and I view, I view this membership at, like I talked about as my family, um, I have a tremendous responsibility to them and my mission is to advocate on their behalf and I need to do it professionally and I need to do it effectively. And I, we talked about, I, I can't, it's not about what I want. I know what I want for this union. I know what I think will make this union successful, but at the end of the day, I'm a conduit for my, for my members. They, they're in the firehouse. They're, they're dealing with the day to day stresses of, being a provider for their family, being a husband, being a father, being a mother, and being a firefighter, they don't, have, they don't have the time to worry about advocating for their profession. They're doing their profession. It's yeah. my job to get out there and fight for them on their behalf. Can I read you something? Go right ahead. What do you got? All right. It's a little, it's a little bit long, but I'm going to do it because I think it's really important. 
I didn't enjoy writing tickets, but you didn't know. I cried when I found your daughter lying in a ditch high on meth, but you didn't know. I was devastated when I found the 32-year-old veteran dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, but you didn't know. I missed my kids' birthdays, school plays, and family trips because I had to work, but you didn't know. I had nightmares about the two-year-old I found crushed under a truck tire while mom was inside buying dope, but you didn't know. I really struggled with every death notification I made to a family about their loved one, but you didn't know. I was never comfortable at social gatherings because with the things I've seen, I can't trust anyone, but you didn't know. I've seen things you could never even imagine, but you didn't know. I really didn't like putting people in jail, but you didn't know. My job was hard on my family, but you didn't know. I had problems, just like everyone else, but you didn't know. This was a letter that was written by a first responder and posted recently on some social media platforms. That's powerful, and it's absolutely the truth. We quantify, sorry, we quantify mental health Mm -hmm. in a variety of different ways. We have a lot of conversations on the podcast about it. We've talked about operator syndrome with Dr. Chris Free uh, in terms of, you know, operator syndrome is this uh, effect on the body and your psyche mentally and physically when you're put under stress and the duration of that stress is not a year, it's 20 years, 30 years. We talked to General Peter Corelli, former vice chief of the army, uh, and he talks about the stigma behind PTS and what happens, not in the in the one or two incidents but when you break down because this is your job and we were in the military we were fortunate you were combat wounded but i deployed five times you had a start date Mm -hmm. you had an end date and you went home and if you thought about it long enough you left it there and to a lot of us you know still think like that but the guys who operate here in this firehouse, law enforcement, first responders, this is their life. And they wake up every morning and they come here and they do these things. And they go home and they do that for 10, 20, 30 years. What's that effect? So you just touched on something that I actually never, never really hit me until you just said it. But um, like you said, you can leave it over there because it, it happened half a world away. Um, in, in almost like a, a, an alternate lifetime. Um, our strength is our connection to our city. Um, but this is, this, is, this is our area of operations. Like you have a, you have a traumatic call. That could be in, in your own neighborhood. A lot of us live in the neighborhoods we work in. I, I just, that just really kind of, I never thought of it this way, but I, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like Would I be able to have the same positive mental attitude about what happened to me if every morning I drove to work and I drove past the street corner where I got shot in Afghanistan. Um, And that there's, that there's a layer to that. This, this isn't just where we work. This isn't just where we operate. This is where we live. And that's where we get our strength from because we're we're defending our neighborhoods. We're protecting our city, but we're, we're seeing it every day. And you talked about like deployments. Um, you have a start date, you have an end date, there's decompression. Um, you know, we work 24 hour rotations that maybe those are mini deployments, but you, you're not, there's no start and end date for that. You, you go to work for 24 hours at a clip. What you encounter during that time is what you encounter. And then you leave the firehouse and then you're going home and you're going home to account, encounter whatever you encounter there. And maybe there's some issues there that you need to process. And as soon as you're getting the time to do that, it's time to go back into the firehouse. And the timeline you talked about, 10, 20, 30 years, that's a long time to be doing this. And the worst type of interest is compounding interest, and it's compounding against us on a day-to-day basis. It's just the, the, the stress is building up, and the effects of it are building up. And it's something that I plan on taking head-on as a union leader. We have, when I talk about advocacy, we have to advocate for mental health for our firefighters and all first responders. We take it for granted. The, uh, you know, I mean, the, mm-hmm. the public takes it for granted. 
you know, and that's why when we talk about respect, you know, when mm-hmm. I was, you know, reading about this and the, you know, the things that you're seeking to achieve, you know, the respect one really, for me, ties in so many things because, and that's why I read you this quote too, because the second part of each one of those statements, but you didn't know, no, you know, how many people I'm, we're sitting here, I'm looking out the window, you know, and I'm watching people walk by, mm-hmm. you know, and when we go out there, you know, there's people who walk by this firehouse every day. How many of them look through the bay doors and put themselves in the shoe of the person who's sitting in here? I mean, every look at society, we live such a fast paced lifestyle socially. It's many people, they know there's a firehouse here and no, nothing, it's not their fault, but it, it, it's an office building to them. Yeah. And just like you pass by an office, you pass by a sub shop, you pass by the firehouse. Like that's my neighborhood firehouse. It, that's where it is. Um, a big job, big responsibility that I have. And, uh, you know, if I, our membership is very humble, they're quiet professionals. Um, it's my job to tell some of our stories and it's my job to keep the general public and elected officials mindful of how lucky they are to have local 718 Boston firefighters keeping an eye on things and protecting this city. It's, um, yeah, you can't, especially we talked about veterans coming home. A lot of veterans get frustrated because I think we talk, it's, you know, the people just don't get it. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know what? That means that you did your job. Like when I, when I first came yeah. home. No, I, you're a hundred percent right. I had an issue. I, I was mad at my family because I was like, you don't know what it's like. And then it hit me one day and it's like, you know what? I went to war. So my family would never know what war is like. And I can't get mad at them for not knowing because that means I did my job. Yep. And people don't understand what it is the fire department does. Hey, good for them because that means they've never had a tragic day in their life. They've never had an emergency. But I guarantee you that on that day, if they do, we will be right there. They say we can learn a lot from our kids. And when I think about this, it's true. You know, if you, if you look at how kids I have a respond, five week old, I'm learning a lot yeah. from him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. you are in full learn mode. Uh, yes. <laughs> that doesn't end, though. Let me tell you, because I got a two year old, a 12 year old. Uh, and so it seems like the learning is, is very a, different now. With that's a, a lot of learning. And, and we're, having a, we're having a newborn now oh, in October. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So, so, yes, there's this wide spectrum of more, learning. More here. training. But my son, my mm-hmm. son's two, and we have, you know, very much like this neighborhood, we have the, the, the firehouse sits in, in the mm-hmm. downtown, in, in the town. And every time we drive by, he waves. And as I've been, you know, getting ready to come and, and sit with you and, and, and talk to you, it, start, it, you know, it starts to sink in. Mm-hmm. And this conversation, you think, you know, society could learn from the two and three and four year old kids who walk by the firehouse and wave to the firefighters <laughs> and are interested in what they're doing because they absolutely love what they see. And I think, I think, I don't know, I think everybody should think like so that. So babies, <laughs> babies, everybody's nodding yeah, over here, but I think that babies, uh, baby, <laughs> babies and dogs never lie. Yeah. And, uh, I've yet to meet a young child or a dog that didn't love firefighters, but no, it's true. It's I, you know, from from a labor standpoint, from a political standpoint, I wish every elected official in this city looked at the fire department the same way a five year old kid does. Um, but I think a lot of that is because we are at our core. This is a very pure profession. You know what? What do we exist to do? Help people. That's what we do. Whether it be putting out a fire, getting a cat out of a tree, putting air in their bike tire. What do you do for a living? I help people. Yeah. No, but what, what, no, that I go to work and for 24 hours at a time, if someone is scared, if someone is sick, if someone is in danger, they call, we answer, we go. People, even like kids, they, they pick up on that and they, I, you know, they haven't been clouded by life and politics and social media and all of that. I think they probably see us more than anybody for who we are and what we're really about. Yeah. We did an episode a couple weeks ago with uh, Eric McNulty. Eric McNulty is the associate director of the National Preparedness Leadership Institute at Harvard University, wrote a book called You're It. Uh, I'm fitting for you, (laughs) which is why I bring it up here. (laughs) But it's it's called You're It. Uh, crisis change and how to lead when it matters most. He, 
the core principles of the book are around this concept of meta leadership. Meta leadership being the ability to lead down, up, across, and beyond mm -hmm. to organizations that affect yours. I think your role and, and, and what you've taken on defines this meta leadership. Also important that in the book and in my conversation with Eric, which we filmed at BU at the boathouse, um, with the city behind us, it's pretty. You got cool. a Harvard guy to go to BU? Yeah, well, that's the how I started it. Actually, I was like, "Thanks for crossing the tracks over <laughs> here and coming over." You know, because the BU bridge yeah. tracks run yeah. over there, <laughs> and they don't come that way. But uh, and then I told them that I wasn't scared to row down to Harvard and walk on their dock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but he didn't think that was as funny as I did. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> But it, this con we, we talked about the Boston Marathon bombing, mm -hmm. and we, we talked about the response that happened there. And actually, so you have this concept of meta leadership, but then also in the Boston Marathon response, there was no defined leader when they've done the and, I, and, and, and when they actually did the after action review, and they brought all the leaders of all the various you know, law enforcement and first responders and everyone together, including like the FBI and everyone. They asked the first question that they asked at NPLI was, "Who was in charge?" And everybody looked around and realized and said, I have no idea who's mm -hmm. in charge. Um, and even the governor and the mayor had the same response. But what they credited that to was this concept of swarm leadership. But it was the fact that Boston is, everyone in Boston is so close. And all those leaders had been in, in their positions for so long and had developed such tight relationships that when the crisis struck, there was no confusion about who operated in what lane, what responsibilities were whose, and then it, everybody coalesced. There was the chaos for you know the, the five or so days, and they responded exactly how each one of their organizations was supposed to, which is odd, by the way, in, in crisis <laughs> response. When you think about your and I, I know I, I know you haven't read the book, and, and I'm going to yeah. give it to you though because I, I sound like I, need, I, I think I think you this need sounds to. like a good read. Um, you're it mm -hmm. now, and this and now you have to display this concept of meta leadership. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh, I mean, what what goes in your mind as you now have to focus on building these relationships down, up, across, and beyond? How do you approach it over the course of the next couple of months? Um, I think continue to do what we've been doing as a team, which is putting ourselves out there. You know, we're not going to be insular and isolated. Like, oh, we're the firefighter union. That's all that we do. With if, if you're not a firefighter, I'm not talking to you. No, the doors are wide open for business. Come down and talk to us. Invite us over. We'll talk to you. We need to liaise and network with everyone that's out there because every agency in this city, regardless of whether they're public safety or not, could potentially have an indirect or direct impact on firefighters and their families. Um, and it's you, the first time you're ever having that face-to-face, -face, the first time you're ever having a conversation shouldn't be when shit just hit the fan. Yeah. It should be like, okay, like, you know, like the, the guys in this room, if the first time we ever talked to each other about what we were going to do at a fire was when we showed up to a fire, that fire's not going to go very well. Yep. Um, and it, st it starts with, you know, normal conversation. Like, let's talk about, our families, let's talk about our friendships, let's talk about our views on things before we get into the nitty gritty of what we're gonna do on, you know, when, when crisis strikes. So that way, hey, I, I, I know he's a great cop or I know he's a great politician, um, but I also know he's a family man. I also know he's a loyal friend. I also know where he went to high school. I know how he feels about certain issues. That allows you to anticipate how people are gonna respond and the decisions that they're gonna make. Yeah, that that relationship building mm -hmm. is front and center for you. I would, I would and think what a great opportunity! I mean, I, I'm a newly elected union president. Mm -hmm. We have a relatively newly elected mayor. We have newly elected city councilors. We have a newly appointed police chief, uh, fire commissioner. You know, everyone. We talked about passing the torch. It seems like every major organization in the city of Boston decided to pass the torch right around the same time, yeah. and. Some people are concerned that that could lead to chaos. I'm confident that that's going to lead to success because there's no, there shouldn't be any posturing. There shouldn't be any talking down to anybody. It's like, oh, you're new in your role? That's awesome. Let's talk about that because I'm new in my role. 
So let's start building this relationship from the ground up so that we can avoid some conflict. We can avoid some crisis. But we know that if that should happen, we're going to be able to work together. Yeah. That's the attitude that's going to continue to move it forward. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so what we're going to do now is bring these other guys Uh-oh. in here. So now we're They've been we're, waiting patiently. Yeah, yeah, they're over there. There's some of them are shaking in their seats, but yeah. we're go, we're going to bring them in here. We're going to talk about talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about commitment to service. We're going to talk about lifetime of service. We're going to talk about their stories. So, let's go. Tony, Josh, Greg, welcome to the Jedberg podcast and jumping in here with us. America. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in the background while, I, while Sam and I have been talking, and uh, I appreciate your good behavior, actually. And I think, I think I've logged four calls since we started. That I'm coming out of the firehouse? Yeah, coming yeah. out of the firehouse. Yeah. Um, but listen, I, I know that we've been talking about doing this for a little bit, and I thought it, was, it would be really important to have you in here. Each one of us yeah, have, have different relationship, and, and uh, you know, for Tony, like, we go back 20 years, um, and uh, you know, he was my first friend. <laughs> in the army <laughs> I'm the only one that stuck around actually. Yeah. yeah okay he's the only one left but um, Tony but he, was my issued friend <laughs> was, well we were in we were in um, the infantry officer basic course mm-hmm. together and uh, we were standing in a formation and you know they're like it's like day one and they're like where are you from you know you have to go around and say and it's like you know no one's from Boston like at least 20 years ago no one was in the military was from Boston and I'm like oh, I'm from Boston and then this other guy and he was like behind me I think and he's like I'm from Boston and I'm like whoa dude you we just become best friends will you be my best friend <laughs> yeah and then I'm like where do you live and he's like I live in Johnson Mill Law so I'm like I live in Johnson Mill Law <laughs> and so we, we we started our bromance. That's awesome. That's what happens <laughs> in the betting school for boys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. Yeah. Um, and then I was saying earlier that he uh, he he graduated Ranger School on a Friday, and he flew to my wedding that night, and was there on Saturday morning sleeping in the pew. But but he made it. Yeah, uh, forty pounds lighter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you withhold you know, chow from him? Uniform felt like a garbage bag. Yeah, but that's <laughs> a great time. Eat? You wouldn't. We did. We let him eat. Yeah, it did, it didn't look like, like him. <laughs> Assuming your left shoulder's a little heavier, though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I appreciate you, know, Tony. No, yeah, certainly all our friendship and how close we've been throughout all the years, and uh, and also putting this together. So yeah, th- absolutely. Thank what you a so trip. Much. Yeah. All the way back here in Boston 20 years later. It's pretty wild. <laughs> you have more gray hair. Yeah, than way, I do way more gray hair. <laughs> yeah. on that, actually. Yeah, three kids. <laughs> Josh, we got connected a bit ago. Um, Tony connected us, and you know we've been talking on and off, and you served in 3rd Special Forces Group, so fellow, fellow Green Beret, and, um, and I appreciate everything that you're doing. And you know, as, as you and I were talking, the first time I was talking to him, he was getting pulled over, too. Yeah, yeah, that definitely happened. I was like, I got to jump off and be a pull over right now. So I didn't get a ticket, though. <laughs> you knew the guy. Yeah. Yep. Was that the night we all went out to dinner? No, no, thank God not. Okay. No, that would have been a separate night. <laughs> that we will not discuss tonight. <laughs> uh, I was the kid I went to college with. <laughs> and, and Greg... You are a. Uh, we were joking with you that you were in the picture with Kennedy when the Green Beret was issued, <laughs> but <course>. it, <laughs> but you've got you, and you you've built really a, a career you know over over the years not only in Special Forces in the 19th Group and just retired as Sergeant Major there, uh, but also here in the Fire Department, and uh, oh. and you know you don't have to be intimately familiar with the Fire Department to understand your legacy here, your family's legacy here, and the impact that you've had over the years, and so awesome yeah. to finally meet you in person because I know. Yeah. We've been yeah, talking for a while. Friend. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I come from a long line of firefighters, and uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been great. I, in my military career, just wrapped that up after uh, 27 years plus. And um, now you got to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. Well, now I come back to DFT. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, hey, retire from that before too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Josh is shoving me out the door yeah. already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wanted to, and, and of note, both Sam and Josh came on as my probies. So, <laughs> so uh, we have what, what, so whatever flaws they have, uh, <laughs> I could be partially responsible. So you're responsible for them. only partially. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I appreciate all you guys sitting here, sitting here with us. Like this is gonna nine eleven impactful time, um, and it doesn't matter how many years go by. Uh, you know, it, and you know we've had the the twenty year last year we had the um whatever you want to call it coming out of afghanistan you know we can sit here all day and, and you know put different terms on what that exit is what i'll say you know what it was and i think it affects everybody in, in different ways all of us here um are really products of 9 11 uh and we talk about a lifetime of service and we've talked about that in a number of our conversations. We had Doug Philippone on in episode 58, I think. And Doug was a range, was in Ranger Battalion and then um, is the global defense lead at Palantir. And, you know, he talks about this lifetime of service to the nation. Uh, and you have these defining moments. And as Sam talked about, you know, a few minutes ago that really truly impact you and then push you in a certain direction and that carries you for the rest of your life. And you guys, not only serve the nation in various capacities, and but now you continue to do so here in the fire department and serving the Boston and all the citizens here and each other. Um, and I think it's you know it's really important to to tell that story, talk about that, and talk about what it means. I want to first kind of go around real quick and just you know talk about military career, where you served, and uh, and and what why you went in. We'll start, Tony. We'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, like so many guys, I was a, uh, directly from 9-11. That was my uh, inspiration to join the military. I was uh, here in Boston at the time. A northeastern um, guy. Northeastern, yeah, uh, just down the uh, street. And uh, I, um, I think I walked to the uh, ROTC office on Huntington Ave the next day and just said, uh, what do I sign and can I go now? They had explained to me that process that it was going to take a little bit longer. But uh, <laughs> yeah. so you some training first. Yeah, yeah. I was um, working on a finance degree, and um, so just made a drastic left hand turn, you know, and um, wanted to get on the first thing going. Ended up going down to Fort Benning, becoming an uh, infantry officer. Um, did that whole Army Airborne Ranger track, and ended up in Afghanistan in '06, and then um, Baghdad in '08. So. Uh, Best friends ever made, made him in the army, and uh, I wouldn't change a thing. I don't regret any of it. Yeah. And back here since. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had a sh when I became a civilian afterwards, uh, came back to Boston. But I was I had a different different job, different lifestyle, and um, did that for like I don't know, like six six or seven years before I decided to get on the Boston Fire Department. So I was I was the older new guy when I when I got on, and um, it was really because. I was missing what I had in the military, like 100%. Yeah. And uh, that's why I changed over to Boston Fire after that, after being a civilian for too long, probably. Yeah. Josh, we won't hold it against you that you were in third group, but <laughs> you're sli slightly above the Marine over here. <laughs> <laughs> we count to three, so. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, yeah, so unlike Tony, I was a little bit younger, so couldn't just go across to the, uh, the office there. I was uh, about 16. Um, when 9-11 happened and I knew I wanted to do the military but what I kind of figured out was when I said hey like we're going to war I want to be part of it they're like well you're 16 so you're not going today <laughs> maybe, maybe later like, hey, maybe, yeah, right? maybe, maybe next week <laughs> um, so you know kind of time does weird things and you know I had always wanted to you know go overseas and serve but as I was becoming a more competitive athlete you know my focus shifted to sports women and fun and, you know, service sort of fell off, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, that's fine. It developed me into who I was, but it was funny. Comes back around that sports, women, and fun sort of meant that I wasn't getting in any good colleges. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and the only college that accepted me was uh, Norwich University, which is a small military school. Mm -hmm. And they were like, hey, if you want to go to college, just where are you going? And my father was like, hey, you talked about the military. You're not enlisting because I don't trust you to enlist, to be quite frank, because you're an idiot anyways. So I went to college there, and Norwich kind of led me to you know, the infantry at the 82nd Airborne, which led me to 3rd Special Forces Group. And I basically spent my entire career at Bragg, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Central Asia. And, you know, that was probably the best place I could have been operationally. You know, all the 5th Group, the 7th Group guys, mm -hmm. you know, you guys have your areas of operation. We go to war. So, <laughs> 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 you guys did great J, uh, J sets, you know. Uh, we were busy actually fighting the fight, you know. So... I mean, it was great because I couldn't have asked for a better operational experience between my time in the 82nd and then, you know, that group specifically in Afghanistan, yeah. you know, but uh, unfortunately, like Sam, I had some injuries that occurred. And I think the bigger thing was I could have stayed in 
And if it was a solo in, you know, event, I would have stayed in. But, I, you know, there's a family that started to occur. I don't know how that happens in between deployments. You know, just kept <laughs> getting bigger. And be, I know. Four kids later, here we are. <laughs> Um, but eventually after my last injury, my wife was just kind of like, Hey, I'm, I'm tired. You know, have you thought about a change of career? And, you know, luckily that forcing function of getting hurt had me come back here. And, you know, I love the army, but I actually, you and I just had some conversations. I started working for O2X yeah. and that was great because it was with like-minded people, just like everybody in this room, but there's still a little bit of something, you know, missing, you know, you're, O2X is all about service and it's a great company. I'm still very involved with them, but I missed having the camaraderie of high stress events. And interestingly enough, to tie this group together, I was connected to Greg and Sam. But before fire department, I got to know Tony because we coached our kids together. Uh. And, you know, Tony, I sort of inadvertently was like, oh, you're a firefighter. I just got this card, but I don't think I could do it because I'm too old. He's like, you're an idiot. You can do it and you will do it. <laughs> and, you know, like, I took the test, yeah. but I didn't think it was actually a viable option. And then between these three guys, I came on, you know, and so I still got to kind of have that. So, yeah. you know, kind of like everybody here, that life of service, that just my path was a little bit different because it was sort of like all with good intentions, but very degenerate beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> the elder statesman. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that old. I'm just older than you guys. <laughs> uh, no, my, my road. Uh, I grew up uh, in Dorchester, and and uh, always I came from you know a neighborhood that thought very highly of veterans and that sort of thing, and 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 um, so that kind of led me to at a young age I wanted to join the service, and um, uh, that wound up being the Marines. I, I kind of I read a book about Marines in Vietnam, and I got I started getting really into it, you know. And then throughout most of high school, I was very focused towards uh, enlisting in the Marines immediately after high school, which I did. Uh, I had a great experience in the Marines. I learned a lot. I did a lot of traveling, and I had a lot of operational duty uh, in terms of what was going on in the in the nineties. Um, and so I, I got to get a lot of experience both as a leader and as a uh, just as a American serviceman going out there on at that time it was largely uh, security operations and uh, and things like that um, both to South America and like the Balkans we had stuff we had like security force mm -hmm. you know things going on in in Bosnia and whatnot uh, I wound up getting out of the Marines uh, after that four-year enlistment and I went right into the Marine Reserves and during that year in the Marine Reserves, I, I got onto Boston Fire Department. And uh, I, at that time, a few of my buddies had become cops. And I, and I was kind of, I had, uh, thinking more as a Marine, I'd make a better cop than a fireman type of thing. But uh, it w w w w wound up being a, a blessing getting on. A lot, lot of firemen in my family, you know. And, and so, uh, um, you know, include my, my mother's dad and then my father were firemen. Uh, my mother's brother-in-law, my uncle, was a fireman here at Engine 42 for, uh, you know, 25, 30 years or whatever. So uh, a bunch of firemen in the family, including my dad's cousins, the McLaughlins, you know. And so uh, also the two McLaughlin brothers served here as well, Engine 42 and Rescue 2. So a lot of firemen in the family, but I was more into like, oh, you know, young Marine, I'll join the SWAT team or some crazy stuff like that. Thank God none of that happened. I became a fireman. <laughs> and, and actually, my first fire, uh, we wound up, I got lost in the smoke, but I did, I did assist my uh, captain, Bobby Dallin, and, and, uh, and my senior man, Eddie Sinek, and we, we rescued this lady. You know, it wasn't overly dramatic, but to me, it, it, it left a, uh, quite an impact. We, we, this lady was basically on fire where we found wow. her. And, and she lived uh, when we got her out of there. And, uh, you know, I was just a wet behind the ears probie, but it, it, it snapped me into what this job was all about. And, uh, and, and I loved it ever since, you know. And so uh, uh, it, was the, it was 2001 where I found out about, I, I had worked a little bit with special forces in South America and, uh, and in Bosnia, um, just in terms of, uh, you know, interacting with them, not so much uh, deeply involved in their in their activities, but I knew that what they had what they had going on was was pretty interesting, and and they didn't seem as high strung as the Marines, you know. No, but no, it, no, it no. It's like they had they had their stuff together. But <laughs> what's that? What's that? These haircuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what's that supposed to mean? They, they, they could put their hands in their pockets, even if it wasn't gold. 
That, you know? No, that yeah. doesn't. So anyways, they, <laughs> they, 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 they seem to be able to well, do their jobs with their boots on blast. <laughs> I, I, was, I was mesmerized by it. So anyways. Uh, that doesn't compute. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, so I, I started looking into, I, I got wind of the 19th group uh, out of Rhode Island. I went and tried out for their training team, which is uh, the, you guys from the active groups don't have that, but they, they train you up and, uh, you know, they only you can go down and pass selection, but they mm -hmm. can, they can kind of screen you to, to make sure you're you're fit and, and what they're looking for and so I had gone through a training event in August of 2001 which was uh, kind of like a pre-selection pre-rugged you know carrying heavy stuff around and getting your ass kicked and all that and and uh, you know a month later was 9-11 so with with um, a, you know, I don't know how many dozens of Boston firefighters, I would say upwards of over 100, perhaps 150 Boston firefighters wound up working down there at Ground Zero in the pile. Uh, several of them are still on, on this job now, um, including myself and, and several guys from our firehouse that had gone down and, and a bunch of firehouses. How'd that work? I mean, talk about that for a second. Yeah. Um, so. Because it was chaos so, here so in I Boston. Working, yeah, I was working on 9 11, and they. they they were immediately evacuating the city. Yeah, and the Weston Hotel and Copley yeah. was evacuated. I, I was working on Center Street in Jamaica Plain. I was filling out the logbook, and I had the TV there. as muted. And I just looked up, and I see smoke billowing out. You know, it's a news copter filming yeah. the smoke billowing out or what have you. And I'm like, I, it didn't even say plane crash or anything yet. It said fire in the World Trade Center, but it was obviously massive. And I knew I, I had a little over a year on the job at the time, but I knew... High rise fires are super complex, and and when they get going like that, they kind of like they're probably going to burn to the roof. Like good luck putting out a massive fire, uh, you know, dozens of stories up in the air. It's it's extremely complex, uh, and and it means if the fire got that big, it's already overwhelmed with that with whatever systems that that building has for to protect against that. So, I knew it was a massive fire there, and I I got on the microphone to the firehouse. I say, hey guys, turn on channel seven. Uh, there's a big fire at the World Trade Center. And then, you know, over the course of the day, we, we watched the rest of the day unfold. Okay, okay, it's a plane crash. It must be a small plane. Then you're looking at it. Yeah. It's got multi you know, multiple floors involved and all that. And then we watched the next plane come in, you know, uh, live. And, and myself and my senior man were trying to figure out if that was, um, we said, was that some kind of replay? And then, you know, I'm looking at one building. That's got smoke. And I see the other building. That's got flames blowing out of it. So I said, wow, we just, we're at war. You know, and so uh, you guys know it over the course of the next um, couple of months, um, Fifth Special Forces Group uh, took over, uh, you know, w w with uh, Air American Air Power and, and other elements, CIA teams and, you know, all the books are out there. So it, nothing, I don't think there's too much secret about that anymore. But um, now we had Chris Miller on last year's yeah, 9 yeah, episode yeah, too, yeah, which is yeah, you know, yeah, which, who's in the invasion veteran. So, so, and and several of my teammates as well, the, my my future teammates mm -hmm. that, that were that were a part of that as well. So, um, you know, when when I watched, uh, you know, here I am, I, I I'm going to this pre-selection thing. I'm a Marine infantryman, and I and I go to this selection kind of program that that screens you to even go to special forces selection. Um, and you know that was just a couple of weeks earlier, and and now I'm watching Fifth Special Forces Group take over Afghanistan and on horses with laser beams yeah. and lightsabers, <laughs> B-52s. That's what motivated me. I mean, well, I studied, well, yeah. I was studying journalism at BU, yeah. and I'm like, I'm going to be a war correspondent. Like, this is sick. Yeah. You know, I love this thing. I want to drop then, bombs. Yeah, then you, you see yeah. these guys, and you're like, oh hell no, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, that's impactful. Yeah, I, I mean, so so that right at that time, I, I I said, oh, I'm definitely doing this. You know, so I so so since then. I had committed myself to, to my unit, um, and you know I, I stayed in that unit for the next just over 20 years, um, and, and, and like you said, getting up to being the sergeant major of that unit, um, and which was an honor to to hold that position. And and my career kind of abruptly ended in a thud. <laughs> uh, Slip away. Yeah, I, 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 we were doing a free fall jump, and, uh, literally in a bed. Yeah, yeah, and it, uh, it it didn't go out with a bang. Went out with a snap, and that snap yeah. was my back and femur, and 
and some other smaller, less significant bones that still hurt. So that, that's kind of how my how that wrapped up. Uh, but obviously, a lot of stuff happened over those years, and um, but it was an honor to serve, and 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 a lot of that same camaraderie that that we have in the in the military. That's the attraction to the fire service and and being a Boston firefighter, like the, you know, there's five stressors of combat that we're taught, fear, fatigue, fog of war, casualties, and boredom. And, and, and you'll encounter all those in the fire service, not on every shift, of course, you know, but over the course of years, you, you encounter all that. So, the, so, so you have, like Josh had mentioned, that kind of, uh, I guess you, you said, like kind of that camaraderie of, of just having, uh, you know, having to kind of overcome uh, dangerous things together. So, yeah, so if so I don't do my job, then something's happening to you, and that's sort of the job gratification. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the it, yeah, it's very team. Sam hit it. The mission team self stuff. It, it's very relevant in the fire service, and you get that teamwork and that sense of facing danger for what to help people. It could be a fire. We were talking about it. You know, you know, it could be anything. If people call nine one one. Boston, I mean, any firefighters, they, cops and EMS people as well, they're, they're just going to go there and it doesn't matter. Yeah, It, it, it could be almost certain death in, in, in the mind of the, <laughs> now nah, we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Giddy up. You said <laughs> death for other people, not us. You know? you've, all ta- you've all talked about the camaraderie, the teamwork. We talk about team ability as one of the nine characteristics that we were talking about earlier, Sam. Tony and I talked about this. We were sitting in... Um, Oh man, there was a bar that was like right above, like where Mass Ave meets uh, meets um, the Mass Pike. Yeah, Bukowski. Bukowski. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he was like just getting ready to to go to the course, and I like just taking the test and was getting ready to go to the academy. And you know, I was asking, well, why? You know, what's the thought? Like, why do you want to do it? And you know, one of the things that we never think about when we're in is the that teamwork Mm -hmm. that the fact that you're sitting around these like-minded individuals, you know, these these savages at times, right. Who, who think like you, they act like you, but you know, they challenge you in ways and there's this level of competition and you're always learning new skills. And then you leave and you sit here and you know, all of us, you know, you get out and you're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, you know, and build this business and do this stuff. And then you find yourself sitting there and you're like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm by yeah. myself. Yeah. I got no one to talk yeah. to. Right. You know, I, I, you know, nobody understands I me. I haven't gotten jump paying. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm making no money. Right. <laughs> or I'm worried about, you know, I can get, I can get fired now. Yeah. And, and then you start realizing, well, what are those? It's like this intangible piece that you never really can put your finger on when you're in. And then you get out and all of a sudden it's gone. Mm-hmm. You all talked about coming into the fire department that to, to replicate that. Why is that so important? And like wh- on it, on when you, you talk about going home to your family mm-hmm. and spending more time with the, with the, with the team here. Mm-hmm. How does that time in the military compare to being here in the fire department? I don't think anything's ever going to, nothing compares to a war zone. Nothing compares to that level of cohesion and camaraderie. Um, 24 hours in a firehouse, especially the way we are here, that, that is the closest that you're ever going to get. And a lo- there's, a, there's so many similarities. It's, um, it's cathartic to people like us because there's a place that we can go with with like-minded individuals and it's not it's not just that we share the same conversations we share the same mission again like what bonds you in combat is your mission what bonds us here at the firehouse is our mission you know we're here to help people we're here to save lives we're here to protect property and you bring the same mentalities that you brought to a kinetic environment overseas you have to modify it a little bit but at the end of the day it's still it's that, it's that same drive and that same mentality. You know, I, I met Greg pri- just prior to coming on. I met Josh through the fire department. I met Tony through the fire department. And, you know, I would say we're, we're pretty four close individuals, four close friends. And, you know, because there's so many, there's, there's some common threads there between all of us that started in the service and now they're right here in the fire department. I, I, I'd add to that that <clears throat> so many uh, Boston firefighters over this generation here uh, are combat veterans. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been hiring so many veterans um, 
and on our crew when, when we all worked on the same shift on the same truck i mean we used to joke that <laughs> we used to joke that our 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 work shift was like a ptsd clinic you know? <laughs> cuz even no, our other, there no shit there i was yeah, oh, there'd, be yeah. pl- there'd be plenty of that you know yeah. and and you know there there would be let's say um you know sometimes we refer to i guess non combat or non service members or whatever Sometimes that might be referred to as normals, like Shh, th- there's normals there. You know, <laughs> like, like, like don't let them overhear us. We, we would start talking about something yeah. on a call, and I was like, "You're, people sca- can you're scaring us. normal people." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, these innocent women and children. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like um, like you don't want to get in a gunfight, actually. But like when you do afterwards, everything works out well. Mm-hmm. You're pretty pumped, and you're pretty excited, and your, your boys are there, and everybody made it out, and. That's awesome. That's a great feeling. And uh, we don't want anybody's house to burn down, but we go to a fire and everything works out great and we go home afterwards. We're high five and we're, we're it's you a know, sense of mm-hmm. accomplishment. Yeah, there. You, uh, I wouldn't say it, enjoy it, but it, there's yeah. something there. I think you just touched on it perfectly. You're talking about this common bond. Nobody wants to go to war, but you need people who will go to war. We don't want anybody's house to burn down, but just like, unfortunately, we're going to go to war. People's houses are going to burn. So you need people who are willing to respond to that, and you need people who are willing to give of themselves to serve others and to protect others. We don't want it to happen, but knowing that it's going to happen, we prepare for it. And to Tony's point, when it does happen, and it will, and it will continue to do so, it is a good feeling. You feel terrible for the people involved, but then you also feel good for them because it's like, hey, you know what? You're okay. Yeah. And I feel good because and I feel great about these guys because it's like, hey, they're okay because we showed up and did our job. And I've got kind of another take on that too is sort of, you know, one of these conversations I had one night in the middle of the night on the flight line waiting for a log pack with my Bravo. He's like, we had a big mission coming up. He goes, hey, sir, like, how do you feel about this mission? I was like, I hope it goes well. And quite frankly, like, we'll see what happens. And he sort of took that as like, I don't want to make contact that day. And we had a conversation. He was like, oh, you don't want to get into a gunfight. It's like, as a leader or as a member, <laughs> yeah. you never want no. to go into a gunfight because that can mean that if I put you in a position, one of the guys dies, you have to explain it. But I'll tell you right now, if there's a gunfight individually, I damn well want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Same way, like, I don't want a house to burn down. But if there's going to be a fire that day, I sure want to be on my working yep. group so I can be a part of it. Yeah. You know, because yep. you're with these you guys. You want to be challenged. Yeah. You want to be challenged. And also, you want to, you have a common thread with everybody in this room I trust to be in a gunfight with and go into a fire. But I also trust that when I'm in the firehouse, I'm having a good time. Like, we used to, the, people, the whole thing, about our, like, yeah. the normals, you know, we, we worked, on, we worked yeah. on third group. <laughs> they used to call us third yeah. platoon, yeah. you yeah. know. But my wife would say, like, when I would come home from work, I actually enjoyed going to work with the people I work yeah. with. Yeah. And my family life that's benefited from that yeah. because mm-hmm. I would come back pleasantly refreshed, if you will. I shouldn't say refreshed. That's the wrong choice of words. But from a mental stimulation point in terms because I, I came physically up. exhausted, physically exhausted, mentally stronger. Right. Because, I mean, especially I came back. I joined the department, what, a year after I got out? You had a quick turnaround. So I had a very quick turnaround. Yeah. So I was in the adjustment time frame where, like, I was, <clears throat> I won't say I was sort of like floating through life. I had my civilian friends. I had a great reintegration from that aspect. I was with my family. But like I didn't have people I could talk to about things. And then I showed up at the firehouse. I was like, oh, these are my people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sam, let me see your scars and I'll yeah, show you mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, guys, I'm a little, a little nervous about coming into this. It's like, no, 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 no. This this will be safe. You you can talk here. Right. Like-minded individuals will attract. Same thing. Yep. High achievers attract, you know, want to be together. Mm-hmm. You know, people who want a public service, they generally gravitate to each other. I mean, we've how many circles does this group run in? I've yeah. talked to you through, I think, three different people. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy and I, besides, yeah. you know, coaching little kids in soccer, like we've connected through different networks. You know, Greg and I know all the same people. You know, Sam and I have connected through what state police friends, mm-hmm. everything else. Like circles you run in are tight. Good people attract good people. Yeah. And you know, and events still happen, you know, here in, in the city. I mean, Tony and I, we talked about um, the Beacon Street Fire, um, which I think you were. Was everybody involved in the Beacon Street Fire? You were involved. In the I was. Um, and then I watched your uh, I watched your speech the day after you were you, know, you were sworn in about the Vendome Fire, mm-hmm. the Vendome Hotel. I want to read something you said. Go ahead. Because I think it's I think it's really important. You said service in the Boston Fire Department is defined by a steadfast commitment to the belief that the service to others, most often strangers, is not only noble and just, but essential. 
As firefighters, we serve to preserve and protect life. Absolutely. What's that mean to you guys? I think it's like simple obedience to duty, you know, as we understand it. And it's like, um, you know, yes, we're going into a burning building, for example. Um, and an interesting thing is that firefighters do the same thing that on that initial search. If you find someone, they'll give you a shiny pin for your jacket. And it'll say it's a metal or, or whatever, okay? Um, but firefighters do the same thing in every building that they go into, and they do that very aggressive initial search. And they're looking for strangers, and they're willing to risk their lives um, for strangers. But it's in obedience to duty. It's, 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 it's answering the call. It's answering their calling. They, 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 and it's... It's, you know, I- if you find yourself in that situation, you, you know, you want someone to come and get you out. And um, the Beacon Street fire was, you, you brought that up. Uh, it was like the ultimate PTSD creating event where it's a prolonged failed rescue of your own colleagues, not strangers. Yeah. Okay, your teammates. And, um, and I'll say like, the best firefighters in the city just happened to be on duty that day. The best chiefs were on duty. The best uh, rescue guys were on duty. And, um, and so that, that's like a, a situation where um, this job is comparable. Uh, I tell my new guys when they come on this job, because, again, they're oftentimes veterans and combat veterans. I, I, is this going to be as intense in com- as combat? Not usually, hopefully never, but you can get just as dead here as you would get dead in combat. So, so you, that's how serious you have to take this job. But, but back to, I think it's simple obedience to duty. That's why we, we have it in us to, regardless of the circumstances, if, if citizens are in danger, we, we will meet them on the X, as we say. We, we will go... It, all the way for these people for for anybody and and that's what we say the the um residents but actually you know at a given moment there's a million people in this city a lot of them are are tourists, tourists students are, yeah guests any we, we will go to the fences for anybody and like josh said hey i don't pray for war i pray for peace but if war comes i want a peace mm-hmm. it's the same thing in the fire service like i don't pray for fires but if there's a fire i want them to call me because I got a great crew, and I think we're going to go. We'll do whatever it takes to get to help people out, firemen or civilians. And it's funny. So, like, kind of what Greg said, I'll take it a step further, but also narrow it down. You know, Greg's talking about obedience to order. You know, obedience to duty. You know, and it's just an obligation. It's something you do, and it's true. Because you look at it, like I've always had the aspect of whether it's war, or fire. If not me, then who? And not even just to say this small group, because there's 1,500 of us who do it, and there's hundreds of thousands of these people in the city that do something for the public good. And so take it a step further from just the fire department. You know, I came up in a household where like, my father was like, you do some sort of public service. I don't care what it is. It could be Peace Corps, it could be AmeriCorps, it could be the Marine, Marine Corps. Corps. Don't do that. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> he said, he's literally, yeah, maybe not the Marine Corps, but uh. you know, but is you're gonna do something that helps people in some way, shape or form. And if you look across this city, You've got firefighters, cops, law uh, EMS, you know, you have doctors, but then you also have volunteers who are going out Narcanning folks because, not because they're being paid for it or compensated, but because it's the right thing to do and they want to help people. So, you know, along the lines of what Sam's comments are, for us internally, it's I want to go help people in fires because I'm capable, I'm willing, and it's my, you want to say moral duty, but quite frankly, it's, you know, an obligation I've chosen to because I can, but it's what can I do to help other people? And we're lucky that we have a job where we're all capable, willing, and quite frankly, that we love doing because it's rewarding and you get to do it with the best people in the world. And when you have a job that you're doing something with the best people in the world, it stops being a duty. Mm-hmm. You know, it becomes a privilege. So service is a privilege in my opinion. You know, that's really well said. I don't think I can follow that. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> no, Tony, that. you gotta nail it. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, nail the hell with that one. <laughs> Not getting off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you know, but uh, actually that underscores something. People are. Greg's got it. People are saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, people <laughs> want to, teamwork you know, right you know, here. Thanks for your service. And I always said it's a privilege. Yeah. You yeah. know? 
So yeah, yeah, and this is it's the lifetime of service. Yeah, and you guys exemplify that every day. Not ed- not everybody can do what we do, and that's that's different strokes for different folks. But yeah. we are obviously capable of doing what we do. And if something ever happened to my family, and I wasn't around, I damn sure expect that capable people would show up and do capable things and if capable people don't take on these professions and don't put themselves in these situations we're in trouble so like we talked about earlier when you i when you recognize yourself as someone who's capable of handling this profession or these stressful situations you do have an obligation to get involved and you have an obligation to serve people and actually, you mind if I chime in here? Because I almost want to challenge you a little bit on that in a, in a good way. Uh-oh. <laughs> so it's not that every, you're right. Everybody is not capable of doing what we do, which is why the Boston Fire Department and, quite frankly, you know, the military and the law enforcement first response in general is so great. But everybody is capable of doing something. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what sets this table apart and this profession apart is that not only are we capable of doing something, we've chosen to do something. Mm-hmm. And I think that yeah, there's not a person out here who can contribute. It's whether or not you choose to. Yeah, mm-hmm. you, you took it. You made a deliberate act. Yep. You know, you you went you went out and did something, and that's that's. You just got a great little point. insight to what the kitchen table at Group Three used to be. Like. <laughs> <laughs> we were this close to solving world's problems, and then Greg had a thud, and Josh got promoted, and I ran a campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, like, um, a commonality we have with a lot of professions that I, I see is. Um, any profession that swears an oath, right? So, like, we do it, uh, law enforcement does it, a judge, a doctor, the Hippocratic Oath. And, and you need to do that because you need to differentiate what you do from the general public, right? Um, we all walk around with this, like, this common understanding that we're going to treat people well and do this and be good neighbors and that kind of thing. But once you swear an oath, you're kind of signing off onto a, a different level of responsibility. So, like... Your, your lawyer can't phone it in because you're on trial for murder. It's your life in their hand, and um, your doctor can't do it in surgery. And then we can't do it when we show up here. Like, we have to do it for real. And everybody that swears an oath makes that same kind of commitment that we're going to go all the way with what we do. So right, there are great. lots of people out there that, that take that same oath. All right, test question. Is Mac Jones going to do it this year or what? Because <laughs> the Red Sox are out of this thing. No, Red Sox, <laughs> Red Sox are below 500. Yeah. yeah, Mac Jones will get it done. Pat's in the Super Bowl. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy was yelling at me. I told you, I saw the, the guy at, uh, at Whole Foods mm-hmm. earlier, and he told me that he saw my shirt, and he's like, you got to get those guys on EEI off. They're old and they don't know what they're talking about. You need to go on sports radio. <laughs> so I said, just go keep downloading my podcast. Maybe we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I appreciate your time. Um, this is truly for me, you know, truly an honor. Um, you know, I, I, I talked about being excited to come here. Um, I'm jealous in a <laughs> lot of ways. Uh, and Tony and I talk about this, you know, a lot. You should have listened uh, to me at Bukowski's. <laughs> yeah, no, I you did. I, you're, you're, like, right. you're like, no, I'm going you're to right. Silicon Valley. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> like, I'm going to go to L.A. and run security. I think you're right. Right before I got pulled over, you told yeah. me it was time. I was going to convince you to take the test. Yeah, am I too old? I'm 42. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, military? Yeah. Take, take the test. Yeah. <laughs> I am jealous. You're over the hill. Yeah, you're over. Yeah. I'm over the hill. I know. I know. I, I, I'm, I'm pretending I don't need my glasses to look up on the walls here. But <laughs> you, you come, in, you come into this building, and this place is truly an institution. You know, I think you guys exemplify so much and everything that Sam and I talked about in the beginning. You know, not only about you know a lifetime of service to the nation and to and to others through you know, your military career, your career, but but really in exemplifying what this organization is and what the Boston Fire Department is. And, you know, I'm a citizen. Uh, you know, yes, I was a Green Beret and, you know, and I served alongside all of you. Um, now I'm, now I'm a normal, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Really, you know, no. We're not going to let you get away with that. <laughs> no, no, okay, fine. Makes me feel a little bit better. Don't run away from your, don't run away from your feelings. 
<laughs> but I, uh, it, w- what you, what you're doing, um, we need, and uh, and and know that when I when I think about what you do, each one of you, and when I think about what the fire department here in Boston does, and when I drive past the one in my town, even though I'm in Connecticut now, uh, my wife wanted to go there. Um, <laughs> for the record, um, but and I and I drive by the fire department every single day, and I look there, and and I say we need we need people like that, and uh, and I know that they're going to be there, and um, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, friend. Good to finally meet you too. Yeah, <laughs> all, you guys, all of you guys. So Thanks, much man. more to come. So good luck. Stay safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. American Jedbergs went out to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Director to the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Rachopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Rachopi, Talent War Group, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As former members of Special Operations Forces, the Jedberg Podcast and Talent War Group contribute a percentage of all profits to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation supporting the families of our fallen warriors. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.